that. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of the 4 Minute Mull. I had hoped to do this from Dublin last week, but then towards the end of the week I got a little bit sick uh, to the extent that I actually lost my voice and I didn't have any salbutamol to take a few puffs to get me through the 5 or 6 minutes of this uh, video. And so I had to put it off and now I'm back in Cape Town and hopefully well enough to get through it. So sorry for my voice, but it, it, hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Sky and specifically what came out of that DCMS report. Although I don't want to go back and look at all the facts that were revealed in that because I think it's old news. I guess the only distinction is whether you think it's one week old news in the sense that all these things were revealed to you by that report that you didn't know before or whether it's one year old or actually even older than that news because you already knew all that and the, the report wasn't so much a revelation as it was a confirmation and I think certainly that's the boat I'd put myself in uh, and so aside from one or two small details there was very little in that report to make you go wow I never knew any of this was happening. However the bit that I wanted to talk about was a tweet that was sent out to me last night by Ted Norhouse and I thought it was very articulate and very well worded and concise and I think very interesting and basically what Ted does is he offers these two theories, two models for how doping would have worked in the Armstrong generation compared to how Sky have used the medicalization and the therapeutic use exemption to ultimately achieve the same objective which is power to weight. And so this is two different journeys that arrive at the same destination. So let's have a look at that series of tweets and I hope you'll forgive me if I go through them step by step. I think it'll help everyone to be on the same page. So here's the first one. It talks a little bit about how it's clear at this point what marginal gains refers to the extra legal use of doping products under the guise of therapeutic use and certainly no arguments from me there. I think that's what marginal gains is referred to for a long time. I would actually say that in some instances it's not even under the guise of therapeutic use. On to tweet number two. He talks about how in a prior EPO era the path to Tour de France victory was to boost oxygen carrying capacity using drugs like EPO or autologous blood transfusions. Talks then about Lance Armstrong being a perfect storm for this era because he was a world champion at 21 and had a hematocrit level in the low 40s and then as a consequence of boosting that hematocrit level into the high 40s was basically unbeatable and that's because a person who has a relatively low baseline of course gets relatively greater benefit from the increase in in this case red blood cell mass as a consequence of doping. Tweet number three says that this is the reason why Ferrari would have taken Armstrong on so enthusiastically as a client. He would have known from results and testing what Armstrong was capable of. Then he says that in the post-EPO test and biopassport era, and this remember was from about 2006-7 onwards, blood doping could continue only through micro-doping of various sorts. And the, the clues in the word is that because it's micro-dosing, the benefits you would get are considerably smaller than you would get from unlimited doping and therefore the blood doping would be unable to boost the power of climbers and all-rounders as much. Team Sky's central innovation then was the realization that in the new era where the ability to boost power was limited, the killer doping app would be to drop body weight through the use of quasi-legal therapeutic products. They would therefore start riders with big frames and big engines. These are track or time trial guys, historically too big to stay at the front through the high mountains, and then take off 7 to 10 kilograms with some help from pharmaceuticals and secret ketone drinks. And the result is that you could produce the same watts per kilogram performances of the prior era. This was the basic model for Wiggins through Thomas. Neither the drugs nor the training methods were particularly novel. What was novel was rider selection and realizing that the methodical use of non-exotic drugs to drop body weight and body fat could allow the type of rider not typically able to challenge for, much less win, the Tour de France to dominate it. Okay, so as I've said, I quite like that model. I like the simplicity of it, I like how concisely it's put, though I realize that sometimes the thing about simplified models is that they tend to creak under the specific details, and I'm sure that wherever you're listening to or watching this, you can think of one or two of those specifics and start to ask questions and poke holes in, in what Ted has proposed. For me, the one that I would question is that Froome is different from Thomas and Wiggins and some others in the sense that unlike them, he's got no pedigree 
basically at all, let alone as a track guy or a time trial champion. And so if Wiggins and Thomas were the product of deliberate selection and design, Froome, I think, is a little bit different. If anything, I think Froome surprised Sky when he suddenly emerged as a GC guy. Remember, he was about to be let go by that team and then suddenly was on the podium at the Vuelta and then went on to podium and win the Tour many times. And and I, I, I don't think that that's not because of weight loss. I think arguably Froome did lose weight and, and as we will see shortly, that weight loss could account for a significant improvement in performance. And so I think he fits that aspect of Ted's model but I don't think he's by the same design pathway, as it were, as Wiggins and Thomas. Speaking of that model, I thought at the risk of leading you down a very oversimplified alley, I wanted to just talk very quickly about this whole power to weight thing and just show you exactly the magnitude of the improvement that might be expected from either doping or from weight loss. So performance, particularly in the mountains when the road starts going upwards, is a function of power output divided by mass, watts per kilogram. And so therefore, if someone wants to improve their climbing performance in order to go from a middle of the pack to a France guy to a GC contender or potentially champion, they've got two avenues they can explore. One is that they can add watts and therefore increase the top half of this equation. And that's what training does <laughs> up to a point at which you potentially exhaust the physiological capabilities of the athlete and then look towards avenues like doping, as is Ted's model for Lance Armstrong, to increase oxygen delivery, which then increases the power output the athlete can generate, or other methods of doping. The other avenue that you can explore is to reduce the mass. Now, that's why cyclists have, for many, many years, been very concerned about the weight of the bike, their own body mass, obsessive about what they eat, paying attention to every small detail. Ted's model, and which seems to be the case based on what we've heard, not only from Sky, but throughout the sport, is that doping is now one of the main strategies to achieve this objective as well. I guess the question is, how powerful an effect might this be? Now, this is just a graph that I produced as basic arithmetic. What I've done here is to assume, and this is a big assumption, by the way, assume that the person can sustain the same power output and then ask how their watts per kilogram changes for every kilogram of mass that they lose. And so on the x-axis here is the, is the reduction in mass, and the y-axis shows how their watts per kilogram goes up. And you can see that someone who loses, say, 8 kilograms is able to go from riding at 5.2 watts to about 5.8 watts per kilogram, which is a substantial increase in their performance. This is the same graph, except it shows you the percentage increase in watts per kilogram with weight loss. And so here you can see that if a person was to lose 3 kilograms without losing, and again, this is important, without losing any power output, their watts per kilogram would go up by just shy of about 5%. And so there are pretty substantial gains to be made. And if I can put this differently, what it means is that losing 3 kilograms would be the equivalent of about a 4% advantage from doping, provided you can keep the watts per kilogram the same. Now, to conclude this little video, in the interest of time, what I would say is important to ask is whether this model could explain Sky's dominance. Sky are not the first cycling team who have recognized the value of mass. You look back, Michael Rasmussen posted this picture of himself on Twitter when a debate like this actually came up a few months ago. Rasmussen was exceptionally skinny. He had no way to lose. I've seen reports that Contador is in about 4% body fat, which is about the same as Froome allegedly when he races. There's questions about how that's measured, but the point is, that this, it doesn't seem to me that there's a competitive advantage to be gained by being skinnier than rivals because everyone's equally skinny. The difference might be that you can recruit guys who are bigger to start with and then somehow get them to lose that mass without sacrificing power. And that's really key. Because as I say, one of the side effects of losing weight is that you normally reduce the power. And when the independent commission was established to look into cycling, a number of cyclists and experts said that cortisone and similar drugs are able to help cyclists lose the fat without losing the power. And that might, in fact, be where the advantage sits, is you get extremely skinny but extremely powerful guys. Athletes 
who are capable of winning time trials and mountain climbs in equal measure. And so that's some food for thought, and I will wrap it up there, and hope you'll join me next time for the next 4-Minute Mile.